conversation. You will be hearing some preachers today. So it's going to be myself, Paulina, and then Jaya. So I'm going to start us off. Um, the lesson that I chose to talk about today is called A Rich Spiritual Diet. And um, many of you guys know just from conversation, maybe coming over to my house, maybe shopping with me, um, that over the last few months, I've been really into healthy eating. So I've actually been watching documentary shows on Netflix. There's one called You Are What You Eat. And then there's another one called Live to 100. Um, I've actually also tapped into, per her advice, or with, with her with her. Uh, Agreeance. I've tapped into Magdalena's classes, and I'm listening to the intro to Human Nutrition and Managing Life. Um, there's a lot of information out there, ladies, about food, what kind of food is best, when it's best to eat it, how much do I need. And so from there, I just started to kind of question the connection between spiritual food and physical food. And God speaks about food all throughout the scriptures. And it's just been so much fun, like, investigating and really digging into looking at God's creation of food. Um, but we do know one thing is that when what we eat has a tremendous effect on our body, right? It can hurt our body's growth or it can help our body's growth. Um, it can, it has a huge effect on our gut health, on our aging process. You guys can actually like decrease your age. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> uh, it has an effect on our hair, on our nails. It affects whether our skin is clear um, or whether we're experiencing fogginess in our brains, um, if we have headaches or if we're feeling alert and focused. Um, but what I also learned as we were, as we were studying this out is that we also have to be aware that um, what we eat spiritually has just as much of an effect on our life as well. And so my one and only point is reliance on the bread of life. And uh, if you guys will turn with me to John chapter 6, starting in verse 25, it says, um, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for that for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on, for on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Verse 35 reads, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And to close out in verse 51, it says, I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And this chapter is really amazing because it actually starts off in the beginning of chapter 6 where Jesus is performing two miracles the night before where he feeds the 5,000. Um, which is kind of cool because it correlates to his to feeding and food, and then he walks across the lake um, on water, which is really cool. <laughs> uh, but the scripture here is very clear that God is our provider, yeah. right? Jesus is um, the bread of life, and um, John records that Jesus has promised that all who freely accept this bread will no longer be hungry. And the description of the bread in um, Hebrew it means divine provision and all the sustenance God supplies to live in his preferred will. So ultimately, guys, the scripture is so powerful because it reminds us Christ is the bread that will sustain us spiritually. He is meant to be our energy source. He is meant to be our fuel. He is meant to be the most important nutrient in our life, and he is all we need for eternal life. And the beautiful thing about that, and I think it's, again, so amazing that we see him feeding people physically and then calling him people, those same people to be fed spiritually by him, is that there's a correlation of the reliance on physical food and our understanding of reliance on God. That's why God created food. That's why he allowed us to be able to need food. And the question is, is how often do we need food? Well, not once a day, hopefully, unless you're doing like the intermittent fasting, which is fine, but hopefully not once, usually not even twice a day. We need food at least three times a day, three meals, as we rely on these, this for our physical nutrients, but this is also how we should re rely on Christ. That's actually one of the biggest things that I learned from uh, Magdalena's class so far, is that it's not about necessarily always what you eat, but it's, it's about the amount of what you eat. You're called to have a certain amount of uh, calories to be able to, to sustain your need. And it's the same with God. We need to be able to have God for a certain amount of time in our day. Um, 
And however, the, the issue within the context of the John 6 is it says that those who saw his uh, miracles, they actually started to look for him the next day. And when they found him, Jesus called them out. He was like, I know what you're really searching for. And it's not, it's not the, the actual spiritual food. It says, because you ate the loaves and had your fill, do not work for the, spoil, the food that spoils. So honestly, what they were really looking for is they were looking for physical food. Yeah. They were like, Jesus, you're providing my needs. Jesus, you're meeting all of these comforts, these outward comforts that I've been looking for. You're the king, right? You're going to overthrow the Romans. You're going to do all these great things for us. And they even later in the, the conversation in the chapter began a conversation about needing to see signs to actually prove that he's the Messiah. But they missed the whole point, right? They wanted to be impressed by the, the, the actual uh, miracle instead of impressed by the, the man who is the miracle, right? And, and it's unfortunate, but just as these Galileans we too can often um, look to something else for more, right? We can go towards extra things to fill our belly, right? We can go to fill ourselves with desires that Jesus calls us out of this trend. He challenges us to not work for the food that spoils. And um, kind of correlating it to actual food too, if you've ever noticed that the more unhealthy food that kind of spoils and it's not like good for you, it's actually easier to access, quicker to consume, and it feels pretty pleasurable when you're eating it in the moment. And so I think of a couple things. I think of McDonald's, <laughs> right? Open 24 hours, super convenient. I think of Burger King, have it your way, right? The slogan says it all. Um, and I have, to, I have to take it here, guys. I think of Hot Cheetos. <laughs> the yummy, cheesy, crunchy, delicious, and quick snack that everyone goes to. I think of things like Hostess treats and honestly any sweet for that matter. It's all good in the moment, but as time goes on, your stomach starts to hurt. And in the long run, there's no real nutritional value in this. So what does that sound like spiritually? sin right it's it's easy to access it's fun in the moment but it's cheap and super unhealthy spiritually and just like food we don't always see the consequences of our sin right away it might be days or weeks or months later but if we choose to continue to consume we will die spiritually and um Honestly, I know for so many, we can, I mean, just in general, like sin is so accessible that it can really make us tempted, yeah. right? Instead of being patient for the full and well-balanced meal of choosing to wait for God's timing, choosing to, to wait for what he wants to give us of this, this beautiful buffet that he promises us, we can want to turn to these quick, easy food fixes of the world. So a couple of thoughts I was having kind of going through, like instead of choosing God, sometimes we can choose putting ourselves in control of our life, right? Instead of surrendering our life to God, maybe we're building our personal kingdom and our family how we want it to look, not how God wants it to look, right? We want the specific man. We want the specific job. We want the specific apartment or house. And then we begin to focus on these things that eventually become an idol. And it doesn't actually fill us like Jesus would fill us, right? Or what we do is we fill our schedule with things. We just, we just are all over the place with things. Uh, and before we know it, we don't have time for God, right? We go to class. We take our part-time job. We then hang out and do study sessions with friends. We have our club, our sports activity, all these extracurriculars to make our resume look so great. But then before we know it, we're stressed. And we're filling ourselves with things of the world instead of the one nutrient that's most important, which is Jesus. Or we can even choose the quick and easy, accessible gall of isolating ourselves. Maybe the gall of impurities. Maybe the gall of binge watching and uh, social media. Because it makes us feel good in the moment instead of persevering with God through the peer pressures or struggles of life. And I just want you guys, for all of us, to ask ourselves, do I look at Jesus as the bread of life? Right? Do I see my dependence for him as something as I do for my daily intake of bread or bread or food, right? Or am I looking towards something else to fulfill my life, to fulfill my stomach? 
do I hunger and crave for him in the way he calls me to, or am I craving for something in the world? And um, just a couple of kind of thoughts on this in my own personal life. Uh, more physically, um, some of you guys know that in the beginning of the year, as, as just like anything, we all have our goals and our uh, resolutions. So I was starting a sugar fast. And my sugar fast was typically, it, it just lasted for a month, but it really did kind of kickstart this desire to eat more healthy um, because I am the biggest sweet tooth, guys. <laughs> like, it's really bad. I'm the one that brings the sweets into the house. I'm the one that constantly is like, okay, I just need like one little treat to end the night. Um, by last year, it was ridiculous. I had hot cocoa. I had cookies for Christmas stuff. I had Christmas candy presents. I had candy canes left over from the tree. I had so much sweets that I was like pushing it to my region. I was like, guys, take this sin. I can't deal with it. It was a lot. But what ended up happening was that after all of that sugar intake, by the end of 2023, I was waking up with headaches. I was super drowsy. I felt foggy. I was super moody and annoyed. And I knew that my body was reacting to the sugar. It was like I was drugged or something. It was crazy. And I knew something had to change. And so I did go on the sugar fast. And let me tell you guys, it totally cleaned up my system. I felt so much more awake and alert in the mornings, less groggy, less moody, just more alive. And I'm so, so grateful. And the beautiful thing is, is that because of that decision, my even my appetite has changed. My appetite for sugar is like, I was telling some of the girls, I eat like two pieces of sugar a week. And I'm like, okay, I don't need it. And so I'm just so grateful. But I think in the same way, I can feel the effect of what I put in my body. It's the same thing for my body spiritually, right? We can tell when we aren't feeling are filling ourselves with God in the way that we should. We sometimes feel awkward, maybe coming into the fellowship. We might feel distant. It might be harder to commit or hard to give our whole heart to people. Um, and I remember a distinct time in my life when this happened about a year and a half ago. Um, I remember that my mom had actually gone into the hospital for um, just kind of a routine checkup. It was a um, chest pains. And the doctor, um, she basically told me that the doctor that day said she had to go on a triple bypass heart surgery, which means that three of her veins in her heart, they had to like replace them. And so literally she had to do that immer like immediately, the, the next day. And um, I remember when I heard the news, I was shocked. Like I was so shocked. I was like, what? This is like, you can die in these, in these um, surgeries. And so I was just really wrestling, honestly, with where to put my hope. Um, um, she's fine now, but I think in the moment I was so scared because um, my mom is a, is a bit older. And so I was like, where do I put my focus? What do I do? And I think I was so distracted, so muddied, and my natural inclination is to fix it. My natural inclination is create, like, a, a, like solve the problem. So the first thing I did was I started calling family members. I booked a flight to Colorado, <laughs> super rash. Um, but I think during that time, during the week of going out there and trying to like serve my mom and help her, my, I did have times with God, but they were super inconsistent. And I just think I, I wasn't giving God my best. I wasn't filling myself with him because what I was noticing is in the time, I got to a place where I was asking God for the desires of my heart without actually delighting in him. Like I wasn't letting him fill me in places that I was feeling sorrow. Um, so I wasn't eating, right, my full meal of God every day. I was eating, but just not completely. Um, so I had to get to a place where I really saw my need for God in my life and in my family's life. And I was able to use that need to really get back on track to have my reliance be in Christ as my bread. Um, and so I think in the end, ladies, I just have a, a, a couple applications just to really understand um, how we should be filling ourselves with God and craving him every day. And so one application I want to say is, um, is to fast. Right, fast with the purpose to understand the dependence that physical food shows our reliance on spiritual food, right? Because when we fast, we get to pray, we get to give our heart to God, and we get to see how much we're truly relying on him and actually how much we need him, even more than the food that we crave. And as you learn, um, it actually teaches or a discipline within your appetite. And I think that's so amazing because as you learn discipline in your appetite, you 
like the way your eyes just open up to see how if I can say no to this brownie, um, <laughs> not all the time, I'm not going to lie, I had one a couple days ago, <laughs> but if I can say no to it for the most part, then, then I can say no to that sin that's just as, that's just as desirous, right? So your, your, your appetite for even the sin starts to change. It's so beautiful. Um, and then uh, the application for number two is create your own personal spiritual diet with a quiet time plan, right? So just like if, if we go into the week and we don't have food, right, we have to go to the grocery store, make a plan, know what we're going to cook, and um, that takes time, it takes energy, and it takes effort. So if I'm willing to do that for my physical food, how much more for my spiritual food? And so having a plan, it actually makes us excited to eat the bread of life. It makes us um, just eager to, to learn from God and get our growth from him. And so let's continue, ladies, to rely on the bread of life and grow in a rich spiritual diet. Thank you. Hi, ladies. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that lesson. I really need to go over that because that was really convicting. Uh, ladies, the title of my lesson is All I Have to Give. Uh, please turn with me to Mark 10, 17. And it says, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And so, ladies, um, in this passage, we see that this man is falling on his knees. I mean, he was really sincere. He asked a genuine question, how do I get to heaven? And in the other Gospels, this, is, this man is referenced as the rich young ruler. And this man was likely to be a member of the Sanhedrin or a synagogue ruler. He was well known among the Jews. And the Jews at this time, they often interpreted uh, wealth as a sign of God's blessing. They thought it was a sure ticket to get to heaven. But Jesus tried to reveal this man's heart and his blind spots spiritually. And Jesus shows us here that riches in itself is neither good or bad. Yeah, Jesus yeah. emphasized that it was not his wealth that was the problem. It was his divided heart. Wow. He was lacking an undivided heart to love Jesus more than his very own wealth, wow. than his very own self. And he was unwilling to give up all he had to have a relationship with Jesus and to be with him everywhere he went. And it says that, Mark says that his face fell and he went away sad. But you know what? We don't really see the face that Jesus had. Yeah. You know, like why, why didn't Mark or Luke or Matthew, you know, say what Jesus looked like? Um, and, you know, I'm pretty sure Jesus was hurt because he saw him and he loved him and he walked away. And he was unwilling to love Jesus more. And in James 4, 17, it says, If anyone knows, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And when it comes to our relationship with God, there are areas that we're lacking in. And it's not only hurting God, but it's hurting each other. And with our relationships with each other, there are areas that we're lacking in and we're not giving our whole heart. And in James 4, 17, when there are times that we ought to say what we should say and we don't do it, it's sin. Uh, or we don't do what we ought to do, um, that's sin, right? Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to share, I know, I, I know some of you already know I used to be a runner. But I'm going to share this story one more time. And so I started running when I was 14, and I joined the club team uh, in Illinois. And uh, I ran in the snow, in the heat, in the rain. Like, there was not a day that a practice was canceled. 
And, uh, and I recently was telling a sister about my experience with, with my coach, and she can tell you later. But his name is Robert Poletica. And if you look him up online, you'll see him deadlifting 300 pounds. Like, it looks like his eyeballs are going to come out of his face. Um, and he was well known in the powerlifting world, and he won many, many gold medals during his powerlifting career, including the Olympics. And uh, he definitely had a tough love approach to coaching. I mean, I was 14, like he would say these things like, I used to be the world weightlifting power lifter. And I'd be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, like, it just, I don't know, it just didn't really matter to me. And, uh, and my teammate Nancy and I, we would often, you know, run races. We would come close, you know, to running first place. And, you know, sometimes things would happen where we'd come in fifth place or 10th place. And when we showed up to practice, he would yell at our face, like, so close that spit was, like, really close to our face. And we would look at each other like, he better back up or else. <laughs> but, you know, there are days where, like, he really was intimidating and you did not want to get on his bad side. And, you know, many times he would yell from his chair. He would have a little megaphone. And he'd be like, you're running like a turkey. And, uh, and there was one time where he yelled on the megaphone. He's like, Paulina, stop being a prima donna. And I'm like thinking of Madonna. I'm like, what? What is he saying? And, you know, I took the time to look it up yesterday because I'm like, you know, what? okay, what, what did he say by that? <laughs> what did he mean? And I looked it up on Google and it says, a prima donna is someone who acts like they are the star of the show. Oh. A person who is stuck up. And I'm like, Wow. <laughs> He called me a prima donna. And, you know, looking back, like, I think it was true. You know, I definitely um, applied everything that he taught me. I, I became really well-known in the area in Illinois. And I, and I, for my freshman year, I came in seventh at state. And, um, and I honestly had no idea that I would be able to do that. And then I came in top ten for the two-mile race um, for state as well. And, um, and I was like, there was nothing that I feared. It was like, I was like... I knew that I could do anything that I set my mind to. And when I, um, when I would listen to him, he'd always talk about, there's never been a girl that's won state before. There's never been a girl. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how many times is he going to say this same thing over and over again? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to prove him wrong. I'm going to prove him wrong. And, um, and I know I talk about this you know, victory of mine, but it's a day that I'll never forget. It was my birthday. And I had a dream that I was going to win the next day. And it was my birthday. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is my gift to myself. <laughs> and I was so, I was so confident. And so that day I'm running, I'm running the race. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, coming through the home stretch. And um, my coach would always teach us like, okay, make sure that you're just like behind them the whole time. Just stay behind them. And then once the 300 meters are left, then you just, you just book it. I'm like, okay. So I stayed behind her the whole time. It was kind of windy. And then at the very end, I like pushed it and, uh, and I beat her by a second. Wow. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it, was, it was the best feeling in the world. And you know, I always like wondered, you know, what is, what is he gonna say when I win state? And so I was waiting for him. I was waiting for him to say, Paulina, I'm proud of you. And, uh, and he didn't say that. And I was like, man, I was like, all this work, all this work for what, you know? And so, um, and it really hurt me. And, and then he's like, you need to get ready for the next race. We have practice tomorrow. And it, it was optional, really. It was optional for me because, you know, it's like high school. It's optional to do, you know, club sport once the season is over. And Foot Locker sponsored the top 50 runners in the U.S. And you had to come in top 10 in your region. And so I was, it was Wisconsin. It was super cold. It was windy. It was, it was drizzling. And it was muddy everywhere. And I'm like, this is, this is terrible. But I gave it my all, and I came in 16th place. <laughs> but I didn't come in top 10. And I was like, oh, man. And I see him, and he's like, I can't believe it. And honestly, I was so embarrassed. I'm like, wow, like he has the audacity to yell in front of everybody and I was like really I was really upset and I'm like this is it like I am done you know I'm not gonna run with him anymore I'm gonna do this on my own and um and honestly it really affected me as I grew older and um and uh and he you know sadly in 2018 he, he was dying of Parkinson's disease 
And um, and I was thinking about it. And, you know, I was like a Christian. I was a disciple. I was like, you know what? I need to call him. I need to say I'm sorry. I need to just say thank you because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have gone to college. I wouldn't have had a scholarship. And so I called him, and my friend Nancy was like, hey, he probably won't know who you are. He probably won't remember because he's losing his memory. And I was like, okay. So then I called him, and I was like, hi, Mr. Politica. And he's like, who is this? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna have you guess who I am. And he's like, okay, why? I'm like, because. And then he's like, okay, uh, Sarah. I'm like, no, Jenny, no. And he was just naming all these girls, and then he's like, Paulina? And I was like, yes. And he's like, why did you stop training with me? <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I said, because you never said good job. And I was like, and I cried a little bit. And I was like, you never said I was, I'm proud of you. And it's funny because he's like, um, and I was like, I never felt like I was good enough for you. And, he, and then he's like, and you know what? You weren't good enough. You didn't make it to the Olympics. And I'm like, I never said I wanted to go to the Olympics. Um, and he was serious. He's like, but you could have. And then I was like, but I didn't want to. I never said I wanted that. And, uh, and he says, and you know the day that you won state, you know what, you didn't tell me? And I, like, I was like, on the phone, I was like, what did I not tell him? And he's like, you never said thank you. I was like, oh, I felt, I felt so guilty. I was like, wow, that is true. All of those days, all of those, you know, hours that he spent with me and my teammate Nancy and the other, other kids on the team. And I was like, wow, I never said thank you. He never said I'm proud of you. And it's like those two things hurt each other. Wow. Um, and this was a lesson that I'll never forget. It's like, wow, I felt like I lacked his approval. And then his, and, and then my lack of gratitude hurt him wow. for a long time. And I'm grateful because, you know, I was able to invite him to church, and he's like, oh, you're one of those church girls now. <laughs> and I was like, well, I mean, it's a good thing. So, uh, but I was able to invite him to church, and, and sadly, he passed away. And, you know, um, and it really it helped me even now spiritually to be like, wow, what, what am I lacking in in my relationship with God in my life? Oh, right? Because what we're lacking in not only hurts God, but it hurts each other. Yeah. And I found a website called phrases.com. <laughs> and it gave me a list of 37 phrases related to the word lacking. And I want to share this with all of you because I thought it was pretty interesting. So the phrase all bark and no bite means full of big talk but lacking action. And it's like, wow, have you been at, And I want you guys to think, okay, what, what, how does this relate to me spiritually? Uh, have you been asked to do something by a boss, a friend, a hus your husband, your ministry leader, and you say yes, right, with a smile, but you actually failed to complete it? Uh, the phrase free-for-all, which means chaos, a chaotic situation lacking rules or control. And I want, I want you to think, have you created chaos in your household or in your job because you lack self-control in your words and actions to one another? Um, the, the phrase playing with fire, which means lacking good judgment. And have you given into that hint of sin that you know you shouldn't give into? Saying to yourself, okay, this, this won't tempt me. Um, another phrase is all over the place. And this, this is like me right now. I'm all over the place. And, uh, and it means inconsistent, lacking a clear pattern. And have you given up on waking up on time to spend quality time with God? Right? Do you always have an excuse? Um, do, you, do you lack consistency in exercising? Like, this is definitely an area that I need to grow in. And, you know, sleep is my weakness. Laziness is my sin to the core. And, um, and sometimes I can blame sleep on, like, oh, well, it's my mental health. I need, I need um, you know, certain hours of sleep. Well, okay, that's, that's true. But what, what's actually, like, what? Is this your sin? Is this just being lazy? Um, another phrase is cold fish, which means a heartless individual, a person lacking empathy and emotion. So have you stopped caring about your roommates, your family members, your coworkers, and you just said things irregardless of how it made them feel? And, and then another phrase is could care less, right? Which means lacking interest, lacking apathy. 
Like, do you have an attitude of just like, I just don't care. Like someone that, you know, someone wants to spend time with you and it's not really an activity that you really want to do and you're like, ah, oh, I don't really want to hang out with them anyways. Let me just say no. Um, another phrase is down in the dumps, okay, which is sad and lacking enthusiasm. And it's like, wow, are you discontent with where God has you in life? Uh, another phrase is knock some sense into his head. And it means lacking ambition as needing a wake-up call. And it's like, wow, have you failed any classes? Have you stopped giving your whole heart to your job, um, to your kids? Uh, another phrase is not worth a dime, okay, which means lacking in value. And it's like, have you stopped valuing God's kingdom and his people and his mission? Uh, another phrase is playing dumb, like, which means lacking in specific knowledge, usually in order to avoid responsibility. And do you avoid volunteering yourself to do something? Right? Just because you, either you don't want to, or you have a fear of failure, or you have doubts, uh, and you're like, oh, I just don't know how. Uh, another one is weak need, which means lacking willpower or strength of character or being timid. So are you relying on yourself rather than relying on God? And then, okay, I have two more. I know what's going on or not. But another one is wet firecracker. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> And it means a person, event, or thing lacking liveliness or failing to generate excitement. Wow. And um, are you self-focused and not willing to deny yourself to help other people in the fellowship? Wow. And another one, a last one I'm going to say today, I don't have time to talk about all the other ones, is stone cold. Right? Are you lacking any semblance of warmth? So in Luke, and you know, all of these like areas that we can lack in, all of, like all of the reasons is because of self, wow. right? It's like you're self-absorbed, you're self-centered, you're selfish. And in Luke 14, 25, it says, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And, um, and you have to remember, like, it's yourself that you need to give up, right? Um, if you're unwilling to give up that one thing because you're putting that trust in that one thing, like, it's, it's an idol, just like what, what Jessica was saying. Like, you can't let that one thing, just like that rich young ruler, get in the way of having a full, like, wholehearted devotion to God and to each other. So I have a practical um, so I want to pay. I want you to pick one area in your life where you're lacking in, and tell three sisters about it, and be consistent for seven days. Okay, I know it takes 21 days, right, to make something into a habit, but for me that's a long time. So I don't know if it's a long time for you, but start small, right, and celebrate your victory together, right? Motivate each other, cheer each other on, and you'll start to see progress together. Um, if you're lacking love for someone, find out what makes them feel loved and do it consistently for seven days. Um, ask your mentor, ask your husband, ask a friend, are you a complainer, right? Do you come across as a negative person? So my challenge for you is stop complaining about everything for seven days, right? Bring gratitude scriptures with you everywhere you go. And so ladies, let's Stop holding back in our walk with God and give it our all. Amen. Good evening, my sisters. Great job, Jess and Paul. My, my besties, I love preaching alongside my besties. It's such an honor. I'm super grateful for Jackie giving us the charge to preach about what God is teaching us. Because it's always just really good for my heart to talk about the things that I'm learning in my relationship with God. So with that, ladies, I have a question. What is true intimacy? Betterrelationships.org defines it as a familiar and very close emotional connection with someone. This connection grows when we form a bond with someone that is based on knowledge of each other and shared experiences. Genuine intimacy in relationships requires communication, honesty, vulnerability, and reciprocity. I've also heard it said that intimacy is to fully know and be fully known by someone. Wow. 
It's a deep knowing of one another. Yeah. Oddly enough, uh, the word intimacy has been used in a context often referring to a physical relationship with, between two people. But the true meaning and definition of intimacy doesn't even require physical contact. As a matter of a fact, the relationship where we have the opportunity to experience intimacy in its truest, deepest form is not even with the being who is in the physical, but who is now with us in his Holy Spirit. Today, I wanna to talk about growing in our intimacy with God. The title of my lesson is To Fully Know and Be Fully Known by God. My first point is seek to fully know God. Turn with me to Psalm 27, verses 8 through 9. So Psalm 27, starting in verse 8, it says, My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my Savior. And here David, who is known to be a man after God's own heart, so he knows what it means to have an intimate relationship with God, he's writing this song from his heart. And you see his deep desire to be close to God. And he uses the term, seek his face. Now, within our fellowship, we do a Bible study series called The First Principles. And what it is is a series of lessons that lay out the foundational beliefs of true Christianity and how to have a relationship with God according to the Bible. And the first study is entitled Seeking God, right? And it's awesome because it talks about how we, sh how we should seek God, why we should, we should seek God, and what God promises to those who seek him with their whole heart. But it's simply only a starting point. Once you've begun your journey of seeking your relationship with God, no matter how long you've been doing it, God desires you to go deeper and deeper in your relationship with him. Seek God, yes, but even deeper, seek his face. And what does that mean to seek his face? Because I already just stated that God is not in the physical, so we can't perceive him with our human eyes, right? So how can we see his face? In this context in the scripture, the Hebrew lexicon dictionary shows the word for face as panim, meaning presence or person. Wow. So seeking out God's face, his presence, his person, it means understanding what is his characteristics, yeah. traits, and qualities. And it's by observing him through his words and his actions in all circumstances. So how do we do this? Well, one way is we can observe God's presence and how he shows up in the scriptures, right? Uh, what he says and what he does in these different situations we read about in the Bible. And that will show us his face. We, uh, we see his qualities even in the beginning of the creation story in Genesis chapter 1. That from the very beginning, everything God says is true. He's a truth teller. Because as he speaks, so it is. He said, let there be light. And there was. We see his qualities in Egypt while the Israelites were enslaved and treated harshly. Exodus 3, 7 says that he had seen their misery. He had heard them crying out and he was concerned about their suffering. From God's words that he spoke in this situation, we see that God sees, God hears, and he is concerned with our sufferings. And he has plans and solutions for them. He shows this in the 10 plagues against the Egyptians that enslaved them and in the parting of the Red Sea to set them free. And these are just two of unlimited examples of how scripture will expose the true nature and essence of God. Another way we get to see God and how he shows up is how he shows up in our circumstances. He will reveal his face to you in the midst of things happening in your life. You just have to pay attention. Okay, pray for me if I can, okay. <laughs> One of the circumstances that I've seen God show up in my life is in my parenting. So a lot of you know my husband and I were blessed to have a three-year-old uh, daughter named Denise. <laughs> She's beautiful, 
she's funny, and she's full of energy, as many of you know. She's intelligent, she's loving. Um, and over the course of the last few years, she's um, actually persisted in showing some concerning behaviors that I, I didn't think much of in the past because I just thought, oh, this is just infancy. Oh, this is just, you know, early toddler, you know, but as time would go on, um, what I thought she would grow out of, instead, these behaviors persisted and got more intense. Um, and as her mother, it's been really difficult to, um, it's been difficult to see her struggle uh, with certain things. Uh, and also a lot of times, me being her mother, I can catch the brunt of her frustration in her struggle. But in this, I'm super grateful because, thank you so much, I'm super grateful because God has really shown his face to me. And, um, and it's been very similar to a lot of the characteristics I've seen of him in the Bible. You know, I've cried out to God in prayer during nights where it's been really rough. Um, uh, we've been enduring what I call level 10 meltdowns. And... Um, some of these, they go beyond just the typical toddler tantrum. Um, she puts herself in harm's way. She's a danger to herself sometimes. Um, and in those moments, I've just cried out to God, help me. I don't know what I'm doing. Wow. Um, and honestly, God has shown me through parenting what it's like to love when it's painful. Wow. Um, to be patient, to bear with your children's suffering. In order to keep her from harming herself or others, I've had to wrap my arms around her very, very tightly and my legs just to hold her wow. until she's yeah. able to calm down. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. no matter what, I don't let go. No matter how bad the, the meltdowns are, how defiant she gets, I never stop loving her. And I never hold a grudge when it's over. I love her unconditionally. And as a mother, I see that I get to love my child the way that God loves me. Yeah. Through this, I see the face of God. I just want to ask you all, like, what are, what are some of the ways that God is showing his character through scripture or even in circumstances in your life? And I want to encourage you that if you're not able to see them, pray that God will open the eyes of your heart to see his face in your circumstances. Wow. And another way you can do it is, you know, I want to encourage you to do a topical study on the traits of God. Just type in God is, you know, or the Lord is. And the search will come up with all of these scriptures and statements from the Bible that tell you who God is. And write down those traits and meditate on them. I really want us to go after knowing God fully and seeking his face. Amen. Amen. And my second point for you tonight is accept being fully known by God. Um, Psalm uh, 139, we can go there, Psalm 139. Again, another song written by David. So that's another thing you can study out, the, the life of David and his psalms. Um, it says in verse 1, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And here, in Psalm 139, David says that God knows us better than we know ourselves. Why? Because he created you. <laughs> and if intimacy is to fully... Um, is fully knowing and being fully known, half the work of intimacy with God has already been done. Yeah. You just have to reciprocate and meet him halfway because he fully knows you. And the sooner we accept that there is nothing we can hide from God, that we don't have to be ashamed with God, there's, there, that there's no mistake that we're going to make that God doesn't already know yeah. about, the sooner we can start being real with God. Some of us don't feel close to God because we aren't we aren't really talking to him about what's really going on in our hearts. And we think we need to be perfect or come to him in some formal button up way and because we know we can't be perfect, we just don't come to him. But intimacy with God doesn't require perfection. It requires vulnerability and honesty. 
it's being vulnerable and walking in the light, like the Apostle John talks about in 1 John 1, 7, where he says to all of Jesus' baptized disciples, that if you walk in the light as he is in the light, meet God in the light. If you want to be intimate with God, meet him in the light by confessing your sins. And when you do that, he's faithful, and the blood of Christ purifies us from all unrighteousness, and we are able to repent, and any of us can change. Amen? God knows you fully inside and out, and he still loves you unconditionally. But in order to have intimacy with God, we have to accept and reciprocate that love. So write these down, okay? 1 John 2, chapter 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. 1 John 5, verse 3. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. So this brings it full circle, right? To know God is to love him. And to love him is to obey him. So if there's any area of your life, and I love that my sisters already pretty much touched upon this, that you feel is causing separation, that sin, that temptation, that thing that's like that sugar addiction that Jess was talking about, right? That's coming between you and your God. Bring it to the light. Get open about it tonight and don't be ashamed. Go after it in prayer and fasting. So nothing will stand in the way of you growing in your intimacy with God. Ladies, I don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm just going to close it out here because I feel like that's enough to study out on your own, right? But I really want to encourage you to do this. Take these challenges and go after fully knowing God by going deeper in your personal Bible study and seeking his face and his traits in the word for yourself. Let's open our spiritual eyes to see his presence in all of our circumstances. And let's accept that he fully knows us and he loves us unconditionally and he will never let us go. We don't have to be perfect, just vulnerable. Let's grow closer in our intimacy with our God. I love you very much.